Hey guys, welcome to Brad Kranz. Thanks for joining me. Monday Morning Leadership, I've got a special guest on today, a good friend and actually business partner, Val Campbell. So I want to bring him in and uh, welcome him here today for this version of our episode of Monday Morning Leadership. We're calling it Leadership Perspective. So Val, thanks so much for joining me today. I appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. This is fun. Yeah, we um, we go back a ways. I think we actually met on LinkedIn here about ten years ago, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Something like Shopping, that. Isn't it? Time goes by, and uh, yeah, we're actually we are business partners in a sense. I want to let people know that. But Val, I kind of brought you on. I wanted to showcase you and have you talk. You know, maybe just share a little about, bit about your background, your passions, and then you had a topic on leadership to share with my audience today too so well um probably talking about myself is my least favorite thing to do i usually i'm usually the guy sitting in your side of the of the chair interviewing other people and yeah, we, and having fun with that but um i started in business came out of the university of washington uh, got hired by a company that was owned by a, a friend of my dad's actually my dad had passed away when i was in school and and I kind of went through that period of, you know, I was, I was 19. What's life all about? You know, all that kind of stuff. Your dad passed away. And uh, I, I left the U, um, although I kept, I kept going to school. I just wasn't a full-time student. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I had a, an opportunity open up to go to work for a construction company as an estimator and project manager, kind of an apprentice situation. And I did that. And within a few years, I was one of the, um, probably five top people in that industry and um, uh, went to work for a Canadian conglomerate that wanted to start up a, a division down here. They had, they had started the company and they needed somebody to come in and, and uh, be the operations manager, handle all the estimating project management and the field superintendent side of things. And uh, three years into that, the company had a problem and um, I, was pressed into service to do a turnaround and mm. fix it. And I did that. And then because that was, it was kind of, uh, the industry was aware of what, what I'd done there. And, 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 and this wasn't because, I, I don't believe it was because of my brilliance. Um, if anything, it really was because um, I'm really good at digging through things and figuring things out. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, I had the support of a couple of vendors, a couple of our suppliers who we needed to extend credit to, or who, who we needed to stretch our credit with. And, and, mm -hmm. and we, you know, we were current on everything. And then I, I just sat down with these people and said, hey, we need to get this. Uh, it was a big federal tax issue. We need to get this taken care of, or they're going to come in and, and put the lock on everything anyway. So um, uh, we need to stretch you guys out to 90 days. What do you need from me? Well, one of the things that happened was a couple of these people, one in particular, stepped forward and said, hey, I'd, I'd like to teach you what I know about business. This guy was worth about 50 million bucks. He was a he yeah. was a really you know, interesting guy. He was manic depressive, actually. And so, you know, he was brilliant genius on one side. And then sometimes he'd go down the rabbit hole and um, some funny, funny stories about that. But I learned so much from him about um you know, the, 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 the process of running companies and, you know, he gave me some, you know, references to some of his favorite books and things like that. And he literally took me to his house one day. I mean, here I am, this 30 year old guy, 20 something really, actually, I think at the time and this, this CEO of this big regional company invites me to his house in Bellevue. And he sp spent all day with the, with me there teaching me how he, did pro formas on spreadsheets and how he, how he, how he built business models on spreadsheets for his companies. And, uh, you know, this is, this is the kind of mentoring that is available to people out there if they just yeah. ask and if they just open up, but that kind of started the process where companies would hire me. And I, I left there, started my own company, um, was also doing consulting work at the yeah, same you did time. A lot with a lot of different companies and a lot of yeah. different industries, didn't you? I've, I've done about 20 turnarounds or startups um, as consultants, or sometimes companies would hire me as an employee to do that. Um, I joined some 
associations that performed informal boards of advisory or boards of directing for small companies. So I've sat on directing and advisory boards in organizations in about 50 different industries. Um, and just, um, you know, got around a lot and, and met a lot of amazing people, uh, had a lot of clients in the high tech world, you know, some of the Microsoft executives and yeah. Amazon, um, also here in Seattle. So Brad, you ask me and, and, and we've had these conversations about leadership and you've really yeah. become, you've really become maybe on the start of being a global resource in this area. Yeah, um, because it's 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 something you really have a passion for. And I do as you'd asked me to do this, I thought I, I just sat and I thought back across my years and all of the probably hundreds of executives that I've been around. And I wanted to boil this down, you know, I, I, I hear this uh, a subject or, or a concept called the the uh, essential uh, skills or the essential elements of leadership that, you know, that kind of a theme. Right. And I, I sort of have a philosophical, I don't know if disagreement is quite the right word, but with that concept, because I, I don't know of any leader that I've ever been around that has all of those things. Right. You, you know what I mean? I mean, it's, you know, they're, they're all there. They're expressed in different ways. And some of these fantastic leaders, the best leaders I've known, are actually deficient in some of those skill sets, some mm -hmm. of those yeah. uh, character elements. Yeah. But I tried to get this down to the four, the best leaders that I've ever been around. Really, I mean, people that had billion dollar companies. What were there common elements that all of them had? the best of them. Yeah. And I boiled this down to four and I'll, I'll share those with you. That's awesome. So leadership perspectives, here they are. Val's going to give us four um, leadership uh, perspectives from his vast experience. So yeah, let's, let's roll. I'd, I'd love the to hear best, that. The best leaders, the best performing companies that I've been around, those leaders had all four of these. If I had to narrow it down, I would say, okay. You know, folks, focus on these four, developing your own skills within these four. Other things are going to come along. Other things you can hire people to supplement. If you're the key leader, it's really, really hard for your organization to be excellent if you don't have these four. So here they are. Okay. Number one, you've got to be able to share a vision of where you are going. Okay. As the leader of your organization, you are the keeper of the story. You have okay. to have a story. Okay. You have to be able to have a story that inspires people. Mm -hmm. Because without this feeling of being part of something bigger and important and more important, they, they are not inspired, if you, sorry to keep using that word, to do more than what they're currently doing. They've got to yeah. get this feeling that... Yeah. I need to grow because I'm part of something magnificent and I want to be, I want to be part of this amazing story. Yeah. And, but so many companies don't have that Val. I was just reading about that too, about vision and that and having this story, this compelling vision that drives people, but so many companies don't have that. You're just, it's just another job. You're there, you put in your time or whatever, boom, yeah. but you're right. You know, to have a compelling vision, like people, I like, think like Apple, Steve Jobs and that people thought they're part of a, a cause bigger than themselves. I think there are basically three kinds of companies. One is you, you're the company, you're the guy at home doing your thing. Yeah. Two is what I would call a vocational company. This is a little local plumbing company or a welding shop or whatever. And your people work okay. there. You're, you're the, the company's not really going to grow much. It's there to provide income for the guy that owns the company right. and in, in, re, in reflection, the employees that are there. But if some of those people leave, they'll get other people. Yeah, exactly. The third company is a, a growth company. You know, this is a company that's the vision of the owner drives this to growth. Multiple markets, sometimes multiple product lines, multiple mm -hmm. areas where you're influencing. Yeah. And, 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 and th these are the types of companies that I'm talking about. The other companies need these 
these qualities to a certain degree, but if, if it's, if it's you and your five people and you are a welding company and you've got, you know, your backlog is eight months because you're, you know, whatever it is, you know, you, you don't have the need to be this great visionary leader. Perhaps you're just, you're a processor. You're just trying to get through the, trying to get it done day in and day out. And what the end result is. Yeah. Yep. This is about putting bread on the table, building yourself a retirement account, all great things. Not, there's nothing better or worse, whatever about any of those. But if you are in a position where you want to be the leader of a dynamic growing company that has, has influence on the world, Mm -hmm. I think you got to have those first off. Yeah. You, and it has to come from your chair. You can't, this is not something you can hire somebody to see. And I, I had somebody have this recently try and hire me and say, okay, I want you to be the visionary leader here. It's like, I, I can't be that. If I do that, it becomes my company. And as a consultant, I've had this happen. It is a really un- unfortunate, uncomfortable thing. Yeah, I'll tell I'll imagine. tell a story about that. I'm sitting in a, a little Christmas party in a company that I was doing some consulting work in and the, one of the key people in the company, you know, you give these gag gifts, right? Right. I opened my gag gift and it's a hat. It's a, a, a ball cap with a bunch of scrambled eggs on it. Like the military have. And it says the commander across the front of it. And as soon as I looked at that hat, my stomach just sank. And I glanced up across the room at the guy that owns the company and, and he looked like he was going to throw up on his shoes. See, he had subcontracted the visionary leadership and, and the company is going to turn to those people, to that person. Yeah. So if you, if you are in a, in a situation, if you have a company that you are, are subbing out the visionary leadership, you better have your exit strategy in place because they're going to be following somebody else. Okay. Exactly. Number two. You have to be the person that imparts values, okay? Your organization has to have values. What do you stand for? And that means that you're going to have to make that tough decision Mm -hmm. that we aren't going to do that because that is not in keeping with the moral character values of our company and what we stand for. Right. It's not enough to stand out there, there and say, we are the great you have to be willing to say, yeah, we're not going to do business with those people because yeah. what they want us to do doesn't match our values. If you yeah. don't do that, if you are the leader of that company and you don't do that, those people just lost respect for you. They instinctively know if you will do that bad thing over there, you'll do that bad thing here. Yeah. And Val, I see that was like a classic case to me is Enron. You know, they want to be the greatest company in the world. And they had all these, you know, earnings that people were saying, well, we're not sure how they make money, but they were pretty much doing anything that they could. And again, it's because they really, there was no imparted values. It was kind of a, I guess, uh, do or die type thing. You do whatever it takes and values. Expedience. Yeah. Be Um, damned. There's no values. Just do what you got to do to get the results. The death of values is expedience. And the concept that the end justifies the means. Yeah. That's the death of values. Okay. You've got to be willing to step forward and say, we stand for this. Mm-hmm. And I don't care what the cost is. If we have to, we'll shut the company down, but we aren't going down the dark side. Yeah. Okay. Third thing, you choose the team members. Yep. Especially initially, especially the leadership team. Okay. You choose those team members Mm -hmm. and you need to set out the principle that this team deserves to work with the best. And if you're the best, this is where you want to be. And, but you are the leader who chooses the team members. And I think that it's, not maybe even the most important thing who you choose, it's who you let go. The willingness to make that decision and sever a relationship with some amazingly talented person who might be a top producer, but they don't share the values of the team. 
Right. Going back to number two, they, they, yeah. And, and, and we all know that there's this, that that situation happens where you've got Mm -hmm. this team and they hire somebody and right away, it's kind of that uncomfortable awareness. This person's not a fit for the values of this team. They're not one of our, our kind of guy. Okay. G our kind of guy. And I've seen bosses, I won't use the term leader because they're not a leader anymore. I've seen bosses destroy companies by leaving that cancerous person there. They couldn't bear to let them go because that person made X amount of money. Yeah. And I've never seen that situation that didn't end up with destruction. Yeah, because they're a cancer, but yeah, the guys, the numbers are there. He's bringing in new accounts or whatever, but he's not, he's not in line with what you said, number two. And if you throw that out the window, then like you said, then expedience becomes your rule. And then you, you throw lost your, your values team. out. Yeah. You lost your team. Yeah. And sooner or later, some other company is going to come in and that company is going to be most admired. And they're going to start picking off your best people. And you're going to be left with those that are not the best in the industry because they want to work for the best. They want the best conditions. They want the best money. Mm-hmm. They want the best of everything. It's not just about how much money you can pay me Yeah, because I can make that money anywhere. I'm one of the best. This becomes about what do I stand for? What's my, what's my working? What are my working conditions like? Mm-hmm. Who, how do I feel about the people I'm working with? Because yeah. I'm spending the top people look at, this and say, I'm going to spend my life creating something. Is this what I want to be associated with being created? Okay. Yeah, if they so, have high standard of values and expectations, they don't want to be with some a company that doesn't hold those where, yeah, they may be, still be the top guy, but the leadership, and that's kind of where I saw myself in my last job, the leadership of the company didn't really hold the same values that I did. So well, you don't want that on your resume. Oh, you were one of, because you got to be out there in the industry at some point in time. You don't want to be one of those guys because if you're one of those guys, you're probably not one of our guys. Yep. And, and I can tell, can tell you, there've been a lot of people that have been tarnished by the reputation of a company that they used to work for. Yep. It's like, you look at the resume and you go, oh, he was, he was, he was with that company. Or kind of like the guy that was, yeah, I was part of the crew of the Titanic or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Or even if the company is doing yeah. well financially, they've got a horrible record. They're cheaters, they're scoundrels, they're whatever. Now, that might not be you. Yeah. But you are tarnished right. by association. Okay. Yep. So it's, 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 if you're the leader, you choose the team members in your team. You have to hold that value that our team deserves to work with the best people. Yeah. Fourth thing, you are the one person that has to provide consistency and stability. Okay. This goes to vision. This goes to values. This goes to who you're teaming up with. Okay. If, if you are wishy-washy, if every day you come to a meeting and you got a new plan or going in a new direction, even though you might be the most honest person in the world, your team will regard you as being untrustworthy. Well, you just ran into a situation like that, didn't you? You were called yeah. to be a marketing officer and it was like the head of this uh, company was like changing her mind like you would, you know, yeah, change like your Every underwear. week you'd show up and it was a new urgency. Oh, we got to yeah. do this now. Oh, we got to do that now. We got to do something else now. Yeah. And, 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 and it's okay. You, you know, you as the leader, you do not need to be the subject matter expert in everything in that company. That's, you know, that's, that's not going to happen. Technology being what it is, you know, you're going to hire subject matter experts. Yeah. But then you need to be committed to consistency and stability. And here's the tough part. It's your responsibility to make sure that financially your organization can be that. If you're, volatility if your erratic behavior is because of financial instability if you can't do it right people are going to know that we're not stupid we're going to look at this we're going to say wait a minute you're jumping around out of the fire pan into the fire 
because you can't afford to, to actually do what you say you want to do. You're just, you're frantically flopping on a dock like a fish trying to come up with some way of getting into the water. Yeah. And that is not, that is not a prescription for success. No. If you can't afford to do it right, you probably can't afford to do it in business. Now, I'm not saying that you have to have unlimited sources of money, et cetera, but at each, at each level of capitalization, mm -hmm. there is a course of action that you can afford to take. Yeah. But, the, but the, the less capital, for those of you who are starting out with un undercapitalized companies, that means that you have to do things in a certain way and it's gonna take longer. The fastest way to build a company is just spend a few million dollars on marketing and ad campaigns. Everybody's gonna be aware of you instantly. If you don't have that, you need to be willing to build your company and your brand organically. And that's going to take one to two years. Yeah. And you need to be willing to, and, and able, financially able, and have the emotional consistency yeah. to, to be able to last that period of time. Yeah. And if you're coming in every week saying, okay, I know what we need to do this week. We got to go over here and the next week. Oh, we all got to go over here. And the next week we got, we got to go back there. Your team is going to look at you and go, no, this person has no idea what they're really doing. No. And I think part of that too, Val, part of that equation that you said about being consistent, persistent, I think is their emotional intelligence too, because we've all been in situations where, you know, or heard of ones where what's the boss's mood? Do they, they're higher than a kite or they're just like a, a, a mad bear, or mad hornet. Then they're, they're up and down all the time versus being on an even keel. You want to be able to be persistent, consistent in your emotions, in what your, your behaviors are. And again, where you're going, because otherwise your team is confused. They don't, they're going, okay, who do we get today? Let me give you an image that one of my mentors gave me and it, I, I think about this a lot because, and I, I, I think it's important for people to have images mm -hmm. that they, that they relate to that they, Oh, that, am I that, am I being that today? Okay. He said, he said to me, he says, I'm like a duck on a calm pond on the surface. I'm steady and I'm serene and I'm just going through the pond mm -hmm. underneath the water. I'm going like this. And I thought, okay, to what everybody can see, am I the duck gliding on a calm pond, knowing where I'm going and what I'm doing? Okay. Underneath, am I doing this? Yeah. Okay, good. But if I'm not doing this, or if I'm not doing this, I got a problem. Yeah. You got to do both, or you're not going to get where you need to go. And I believe that leadership in number four here is the ability to do both. Yeah. Work like crazy and look like you're doing it with ease. That's awesome. Hey, thanks for sharing those four, uh, you know, leadership aspects, Val. Hey, one, I want to kind of throw maybe a little bit of a, a curveball here to you, but what is your why? What's your big why? What motivates you here today as we talk? You know, um, this is a this is a, a very interesting question because I think it's important for people to undercover uncover that, mm -hmm. and it's very personal, right? It's this mm -hmm. is something that you are going to relate to, but you, I think people need to get a handle on that on a very base level. Yeah. And years ago, I kind of went through a um, an exercise where I kind of peeled that onion, and what I came down to is I'm here for growth. I love learning. I am, I, I am absolutely not motivated by money. I, 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 I'm going to say I love money. I, I really like having money. Okay. It's kind of an important thing in this world. Yeah, it is. It is. But I'm highly motivated by learning things and figuring out how things work. And this becomes a reward system for me Yeah. to, to investigate things and learn how it works. What, motivates me is my family. Yeah. Um, the, the fact that I'm part of something that I can contribute to the future of some people. 
I, I, I'm not under any illusion that I'm going to change the world, but I can change the world for a few people. I can give them opportunities that they may not have had if I didn't live. Yeah. If and your I, wife is from the Philippines. So you've got a lot of kind of extended family in the Philippines. You've been yeah. there a number of times. So I know that's big on your heart is to really help out uh, those in your family that are in, still living in the Philippines and be able to, I guess, yeah. economically empower them would be the term I would use. And mentoring and, and yeah. all of that, you know, it's, yeah. this is, this, this goes so many different directions, Brad. It's really, it, it, I, th I think it's a fascinating, you know, subject. A uh, number of years ago now, probably, I don't know, six, whatever years ago, I decided I wanted to be, get remarried. Um, I, I, I don't like being single. I don't, I, I want to be part of something. I want to be part of building something. And I, and, and that part of my life, which I had previously was gone. My children were grown. They were off on their own thing. And I was desperately, desperately missing mm -hmm. that component that, that you have around the holidays and the, the events and things. Cause they were, they were creating their own and I would get invited to some things, but it's not the same thing as being in your house. Yeah. So I decided that I wanted to start another family. Why not? You know, this, this isn't, you know, 1850s. Mm -hmm. we, we live in a different age and someone yeah. my age can start another family if they want, you know, I can become part of another family. And, and it, this is something that developed over a period of a couple of years. And, and you've heard some of that story. I won't go yeah. into the whole thing here, but this is, this was the genesis of that was that, and I know this sounds, you know, the, people can psychoanalyze this all you want. I was no longer primarily essential. I'd done a pretty good job of raising my kids to the point where they were pretty independent. Yeah. I can be there for my grandkids. It's not the same thing. Still always going to be there for them. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to have that kind of participation that I'd missed. Mm -hmm. And um, so I set about you know, recreating that in my life. And how was I going to do that? What, did, what, what specification did I have for that person? What, what did I, what, what kind of person, what personality, what, whatever would match with me mm -hmm. to create this. And then, and then it just, the, the whole thing, I was in a business group uh, in Southeast Asia uh, doing, you know, opening up some markets for a company down there and was, was in some social media groups and, yeah. and, you know, started meeting and talking to people. And there was this woman there and, and, and I, as shallow as it might be, it was, oh my Lord, look at that woman. Who, who is that? And um, I just sent a friend request and we started talking and became friends. And the rest is, as they say, history, you know. And, and today yeah. I'm, I'm just married to this incredible woman who, yeah. some, she and I were just talking about this yesterday. We are, neither one of us, I think, are maybe the easiest people to live with. We're intense. We're, yeah. we, we have flashes. I'll, I'll just say we have flashes of brilliance with stubborn personalities attached, you know, and, yeah. and I can be cranky. Um, you know, I get intense. I'm, I'm into my projects. I'm writing, I'm doing this yeah. and that thing. And, and, you know, she'll say something, what, you know, and she says, you know, but we laugh, we, we yeah. laugh more than any two people I think I've ever been around. That's awesome. And, and uh, um, it, 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 it is really a blessing to me. I hope That's I'm great. a blessing to her. Yeah. And uh, so, you. you know, I, I have different passions. I'm, I'm really into this writing project right now. And well, I want to I, ask you about that, Val. I know your, your wife, I, I would love to have her on sometime, but I mean, she's kind of turned into a whole social media maven in oh, uh, yeah. Southeast Asia. That's a whole story on its own, but you are actually, you are writing a novel. Maybe just give me kind of a quick minute or so synopsis on that before we close out. But that's really interesting. Well, uh, it, I, I love to write. I'm always writing, you know, usually things on social media where I'm battling with someone. You know? mm -hmm. so I, I told Ams, I, I really should just stay out of that stuff, but I can't help it. It's like, yeah. I see somebody post something. It's like, no, you know, it's stupid. So, you can't not respond. I, you know, I'm, I'm, a, you know, they, I'm, I'm the easiest person to troll in the world. You know, I've got my triggers. All you got to do is throw that out there. And I'm like, ah, 
but uh, but I love to write. I've always loved to write, do technical writing. I've done a lot of that, different, mm -hmm. different types of things. But I was doing some reading recently, and like I have often times in my life, I've, I, I'm reading a book. And I'm thinking I can write better than this, and 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 then I kind of went, yeah, I can write better than this. Yeah. And and so I I just about I don't know three maybe four weeks ago. I just sat down on a Sunday afternoon and I just started writing and it's, it's been one of the most amazing experiences of my life. It's not yeah. what I thought it would be at all. Yeah. It, it, you think you're in control of the story, but I'm telling you, it develops a life of its own. And mm. pretty soon you're putting stuff down and you're going, wow, I didn't see that coming. You know, it just, it just creates itself. Uh, I'm the pipe. It flows out of kind of, yeah. and I, and I, I really feel like I've got a lot of experiences in my life mm -hmm. um, that contribute to some of these things. And I, you know, weirdly, coincidentally, perhaps I know people who have lived lives that rival anything in any Tom Clancy movie or, or yeah. any, I mean, you know, we, we sit around sometimes and talk about these things and laugh about these characters yeah. and, and on the books and the movies and how they do things. And we sit and we go, yep, that isn't how, that isn't how it goes. That's right. not how it works. Right. And so I thought, you know, I want to write a book about an actual adventure, about an actual based on something real. This actually happened. Mm -hmm. These people actually exist. Cause I, I fictionalize everything because right. you can't, you can't get into the specifics, but right. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a cyber spy thriller romance uh, okay. intrigue. Um, it's going to be, it's going to be, it is pretty, pretty hot in some places, you know, there's yeah. some, there's some sexy stuff there and some okay. fun and, but it's true to life. It's, this is actually awesome. what, actually what people do. So well, I'm in, I'm, I'm interested to want to read it. Do you have a title for it at this point? The title is going to be Operation Austin. At least that's the title at this Operation point. Operation Austin. Guys. Operation Austin. I've got, okay. I've actually got four or maybe five books in mind. Wow. And each one of them is going to be Operation. The next one is going to be Operation Miami. The one after that's wow. going to be, I think, Operation Davao. Okay. Uh, so it's a Davao city in the Philippines. So it's, I've got these different, uh, um, the, these different you know, concepts, there's a lot of spinoffs involved in it. Okay. Like I said, it's, you know, it just kind of took on a life of its own. And pretty soon I'm saying, oh, wait a minute, that would be a really great book to go off over there and do that. Wow. So, well, a lot that's... of fun stuff. So oh, who knows? It, I write for me. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I do have a couple of people that I know that with specific, specific expertise that or experiences yeah. that have, have started reading some of it a little bit and, and have yeah. given me some feedback that, wow, this is really great. good. So We'll see. Well, maybe we can say before he became famous, here's Val Campbell talking about Operation Austin, uh, the 2B bestseller out there. Um, Val, thanks so much for uh, taking time to share with me today. Guys, hey, I just want to encourage you to reach out to him. I'll leave his contact information if you have questions about him on his background, um, stuff he said about leadership. Maybe you've got questions about his new novel. Uh, please reach out to him. But um, Val, thanks for joining us. And do you have any like last words before we uh, close out here. oh no the other thing i'd say is yeah gary booker is the name the main character in in, in my novel and uh, okay. you know gary gary booker um you know i'm on i'm gary booker's i've, I've got a page on facebook and it's gonna be fun okay. we're gonna have some fun with this and and uh, we'll see where it goes and thank you so much this has been this has been fun i i hope i can hope i shared some things of value with yeah, people there from you did from 40 years of uh, consulting yeah. experience yeah well guys thanks for tuning right. in to monday morning leadership today guys have an awesome monday bye-bye see you later